Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Christmas December edition of the Viva podcast. My name's Chris Townsend. I hope you're all doing okay. I feel slightly guilty at calling it the Christmas edition as it's only December the 1st, but that's when the show comes out. I know it gets a bit annoying when all the shops come out with their um, with their Christmas songs and bombarding you with potential Christmas presents as well. So I don't want to put the pressure on you, but there's only 25 days to go. <laughs> We've got an absolutely action-packed show for you today. It's actually going to be an extended episode because A, it's Christmas and B, there's so much quality material. In the first part of the show, our founder, Juliet Galatly, goes to Dean Farm to see the turkeys that have been rescued. We have an absolutely wonderful interview with Cowspiracy executive producer, Salish Rao. What a lovely guy. And he speaks some real truth, so it's well worth listening to. I catch up with Sophie and Katrina from the Viva shop. And they give you the lowdown and all the latest goodies that we've got available at the shop right now over the Christmas period. Benjamin Zephani gives us his classic poem, Talking Turkeys. There's that and so much more on the show. So subscribe, listen and share to the Viva podcast. You can subscribe on all major platforms or listen again on viva.org.uk forward slash Viva podcast. We love hearing from you. So there's a speak pipe button on the website where you can give us your feedback and questions. Viva's Christmas podcast. We hope you enjoy it. Despite a significant decline in recent years, millions of turkeys are still getting slaughtered in the UK and around the world. The vast majority of them spend their short lives in vast industrial sheds. They never even go outside. Don't buy turkey meat. Go vegan with Viva. And if you're already vegan, spread the message. Use our leaflets to spread the word. Turkeys have a real zest for living treated with respect they become really really friendly they have large dark almond shaped eyes sensitive fine bone faces and wild turkeys actually roost in trees and roam in woodlands and an adult bird can fly up to 50 miles an hour now regarding conditions in turkey farms there are three main systems of turkey rearing there's a windowless units and this is the most common system because you get as many as 25,000 turkeys kept in one shed And this actually makes up around 90% of turkey accommodation in the UK. Secondly is pole barns. These allow daylight and a bit of ventilation, but conditions are still grossly overcrowded. Stress causes fighting and the birds attack each other's eyes and their toes. And lastly, free range. On free range farms, turkeys, they may be afforded more space, maybe a thousand birds per hectare. They may be subjected to the same mutilations as their more intensively reared birds. And those labelled as organic are additionally not afforded antibiotics they're both intensively reared and free-range turkeys are susceptible to disease including bird flu and at the end of the day they all die when they don't want to now the slaughter age i mean turkeys would live around 10 years in the wild farm turkeys are usually slaughtered between the ages of 12 and 26 weeks although according to defra some are as young as eight weeks between 5 and 15% of turkeys die in sheds each year. Many die because they never learn to reach the food in the water points. Others die from disease or as a result of growing too quickly. Turkey farms are not a good place to be for turkeys. They peck at each other's feathers, toes and eyes when they're overcrowded. Sometimes their eyeballs are destroyed by the pecking and cannibalism can be common in intensive farms. They're often kept in darkness to discourage cannibalism. Now on a lighter note, Juliet went to Dean Farm recently to see the turkeys. It's a complete contrast to what I've described. Viva's message to you is please, please, please don't eat turkeys this Christmas. I'm here at Dean Farm Animal Sanctuary and I'm surrounded by turkeys and hens who are living very harmoniously at the moment, all rescued girls. The turkeys, they're here, they've got, um, I'd say, almost a sky blue wattle on their head, um, which changes to a pinky colour underneath. And um, with strong emotions, those can change literally within seconds. I just thought I'd come and talk to them today. They know that they're all around me asking for apple. You have to tra- I have to chop the apple really, really small. They like it chopped up very precisely. And they know that I do that. And that's what they're asking for at the moment. And um, I just thought at this time of year, Christmas, with so many people <laughs> um, thinking about eating turkey, it'd be nice to actually talk about them 
as the special, special animals that they are. Um, people forget that wild turkeys um, come from America, from the, from the United States, from that kind of area, and they're still there. They're gregarious birds. They live in flocks which are called rafters, and they have a dominant male, don't you, called a tom, and the girls, they're called hens. <laughs> Or, actually, a lot of people call the females Jennies and the, and the males Jakes. And you've got superb hearing and eyesight and powerful flyers. And I think what a lot of people don't know, because all they ever see are pictures of the farm turkeys, is that they can actually fly up to 55 miles per hour. And they can run, yes, up to 25 miles an hour. That's the wild turkeys. And, of course... When you go inside a factory farm, which I've been in many times, one of the biggest was Bernard Matthews in Western Longville, which is Norfolk Way. There are just huge industrialised sheds. And the birds literally were the most crowded in of any birds I've ever seen in my life, such that I couldn't even walk through because the birds literally were so packed in they couldn't get out of the way of your feet. Um, there were many dead birds and dying birds in there, injured birds. Um, and you can imagine if you were crowded in somewhere with 25,000 other human beings where you could barely move, um, it wouldn't exactly bring out the best in you. So, of course, some resort to aggression. Um, it's surprising that more don't actually under that scenario. But, of course, the farm birds, they're being genetically manipulated so that they're far too overweight. Um, almost all of them have joint problems because their joints just give un un away under the uh, unnatural strain. Um, so, of course, they can't run at 25 miles an hour like their wild counterparts. But these turkeys are doing really, really well. And um, Mary and other the workers here work really hard to get them wa wa walking and exercising so that their legs have strengthened up and their joints have strengthened up an awful lot. And they're walking really, really well now. Um, I remember when I rescued a bird... Um, that got lots and lots of attention is a turkey that was given away to our supporters through a raffle, believe it or not. And they asked, they asked, um, they were churchgoers and they entered a raffle. They asked for the turkey, which was the prize, to be given to them alive instead of dead. And they agreed and the farmer gave them a turkey and said he was a boy. And it got lots of attention. And this turkey that we call Bertie was handed to myself um, this is a few years ago now and actually went national over, all over everything from GMTV to even newspapers like The Sun but this turkey became famous as the rescue turkey at Christmas but for me it was the first time I'd actually rescued a turkey myself and I hadn't realised what it was like to live and befriend a turkey and in fact he turned out to be she she laid just one egg so we changed her name from Bertie to Gertie and she was, I suppose for most people the animal that I would more liken a turkey to would be a dog because she followed us everywhere she wanted to be part of the family and the hens were much more independent we found the ones that we rescued but Gertie just wanted to be with you so much of the time and I found out discovered like these turkeys here actually there's one practically on my lap um love massage and I'll try now if I massage the shoulders you stand still and start to yeah, shimmy um, and go into a dreamlike state, I suppose like we do. And um, I also remember the first time that Gertie felt rain because, of course, you'd come out of a shed and you forget that they've had no um, access to anything that's natural at all. And I remember her just dancing in the puddle on the yard and just standing there, just dancing. It was just one of the most wonderful things and just feeling this soft rain on her back. I found out subsequently that turkeys actually have superb hearing and eyesight, much better than human beings actually, although they don't see that well in the dark, so they get very wary at night. Um, but in the daytime, they see um, considerably better than we do, very, very sharp eyesight. And I guess that's partly to do with their, um, um, in terms of what they feed, because they feed on all sorts of things. And they scratch away at the, at, the, at the land. If you've got them, you'll see them in your garden scratching away to um, dig things up in the way that um, hens of course do as well and pecking at um, the box of trees and stuff to get stuff off and the, the wild turkeys the toms are polygamous so they mate with several hens in the same year and each hen um, or jenny as they're called will have about eight to 18 eggs in the whole year and you contrast that to the modern intensive farming where you have the breeding stock where the hens 
um, are laying eggs, fertile eggs all year, those um, fertile eggs are taken immediately from the um, the mothers. Um, of course, they never get to incubate them. They're put in so-called hatcheries where they hatch. And then at just one day old, they're put into these huge sheds, as I said, about 25,000 in each shed, very much like the boiler chickens. Um, I noticed when I went round the, um, the sheds as well that um, they are grossly overweight, so they've been bred to have these huge chests, of course, which means that the males cannot even naturally mate with the females. So, in fact, they so-called milk them. In other words, it's like human titation, masturbation, where literally the, um, the, 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 the turkeys um, semen is taken by human beings and then the females are artificially inseminated with syringes, sort of held upside down and the syringe goes in. Um, and that's what happens in the breeding sheds just over and over and over with these thousands and thousands of birds um, kept in appalling conditions. And then those that are bred for meat, of course, they go into the so-called boiler-like sheds where they're kept on floors. And, and the, when you go in, it's one of the things I notice very quickly um, in the various sheds I've been that the, the, the litter on the floor of the shed just becomes an absolute mass of, you know, the excreta, of course, and so you have a as you come towards Christmas and then being killed for the Christmas trade where many of the birds have got ulcerated feet and you'll see them with injured legs and it's because of the ammonia from the actual stinking litter that literally is burning away at the feet which they can never get away from. And I think, you know, you can just say that but if you just stop and think about that, imagine if we were kept in somewhere with bare feet where, you know, we were excreting in that shed, thousands and thousands of us. Um, and yet we just... Not us, and probably not you, the listener, but society as a whole just dismisses what we do to these animals as if it's just nothing. We just don't think about it. We're not encouraged to think about it. But um, things are changing. I mean, for example, although, I mean, this is horrendous, um, 16 million turkeys we killed in 2017, and of, te of those, about 10 million for the Christmas market. But just to remind us all that just 10 years ago, it was about 40 million birds. So Viva has actually made a huge impact because when we did the expose of Bernard Matthews, it went on the front page of a major national newspaper three years in a row, unbelievably. Um, and the actual turkey trade, they complained um, themselves, saying that the, the actual amount of people eating turkeys was dropping from the expose. It's, it's unusual for a farmer to actually admit to that, but that's what they said. Um, so things are, they are changing. And um, Bean Farm's got about 60 acres. Those of you that have seen it, when you arrive, there's a pop-up shop here for Christmas. It's in a big barn at the front, but behind it, there's acres and acres of beautiful rolling um, fields, but also woodland as well. And turkeys are actually naturally woodland animals. Um, a wonderful documentary, if you YouTube it, search for it, um, by a wildlife biologist who actually lived with turkeys for a while in the jungles. Um, just an amazing documentary, and you see how bright um, um, th these animals are and how observant they are about the world. He went out work walking in the jungle every day um, around where he lived, and he said he'd noticed a snake about three times in one year. And when he went w w walking out with the turkeys, um, he noticed them every single day because the turkeys pointed them out. <laughs> so he'd been blissfully walking past them in, in blissful ignorance for, for practically most of his um, adult life. Um, but there they were. So Dean Farm has got, if you want to find out a bit more about them, just go along to the Facebook page and you'll see more about the stories of the turkeys, but lots of the other animals here too. And um, give their page a like and give them some support. So the turkeys here have got um, the cool wattles on the top of the head. They're sort of like, um, it's not exactly sky blue, it's a beautiful shade of blue actually, sort of an ice blue actually, that's intermingled with little bits of pink. And their feathers are incredible because in different lights they're iridescent and they shine different colours. So now I'm in sunlight, it's a beautiful winter day. And they're very dark, almost black. But actually in some lights, now now one of the turkeys next to me, she's turning round. And it's shining bright greens and also sort of copper colours. And then at the back, the turkeys go into sort of a black, brown and white. So they're actually rather magnificent birds. I think 
we should give the last word to th- these girls here. What do you think about living at Dean Farm Sanctuary? What, what's, 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 your, what's your opinion? Yeah? What, do you like it here? Yeah? And do you like being outside with all these acres of land? I love the communication. They've got all kinds of different sounds. Not just the gobble gobble that you sort of associate with turkeys, that which is often the males calling. But they've got all kinds of different sounds that they use. Beautiful, beautiful vocalizations. Absolutely fascinating. I find the turkeys very friendly birds. When you walk into M Dean Farm, they call you and call you over actually. And um, if you don't go straight away, their calls get stronger. <laughs> they make it very clear that they want you over there. Now they've got a nice area in the barn with a pop hole where they can just walk in and out, which is just left permanently open. Now they come outside in the sunshine or go back into the straw, whichever they prefer. And they're living here with hens who are caged hens. You also like sort of guard turkeys, aren't you? Anybody strange comes in, they really, really call, so you know that there's somebody around. And it was really sweet when um, Hope was rescued because the turkeys came over and were watching everything and being part of um, the pig's life as well since they got here too. Because the turkeys, in fact, of course, were all farm birds and all being rescued. It's horrible to think that they'd all be dead now. It's just it's, when you actually get to know these animals and all their personalities, it's just unbearable to think that somebody who have actually eaten them. It's just, God, it's just totally unthinkable. It just seems insane that people actually celebrate this important time of year with all their family by killing these beautiful, beautiful birds. When, of course, we can all celebrate by celebrating life and eating delicious vegan food and no one's hurt. So, everybody, have a wonderful Christmas, a wonderful, wonderful, vivacious Happy, wonderful vegan day. And that was when Juliet Galatly went to visit the turkeys at Dean Farm Animal Sanctuary. And on a similar note, let's listen to Benjamin Zephaniah's classic poem, Talking Turkeys. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. <laughs> because turkeys just want to have fun. Turkeys are cool and turkeys are wicked. And every turkey has a mum. <laughs> be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Don't eat it, keep it alive. It could be your mate and not on your plate. <laughs> Say, yo, turkey, I'm on your side. <laughs> I've got lots of friends who are turkeys. <laughs> and all of them fear Christmas time. They say, Benj, hey, Benj, man, <laughs> I want to enjoy it, man. It's a Jamaican turkey. <laughs> but those humans have destroyed it, man. And those humans are out of their mind. Yes, I've got lots of friends who are turkeys and all have the right to a life, not to be caged up and genetically made up by a farmer and his wife. No, turkeys just want to play reggae. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Turkeys just want to hip-hop. Have you ever seen a nice young turkey saying, hey man, I cannot wait for the chop? <laughs> Turkeys would like to get presents. <laughs> Turkeys want to watch Christmas TV. Turkeys have brains and turkeys feel pain in many ways like you and me. I once knew a turkey. His name was Turkey. He said, Benji, explain to me, please. Who put the turkey in Christmas? And what happens to Christmas trees? I said, I'm not too sure, Turkey, but it's got nothing to do with Christmas. No, humans get greedy and waste more than need be, and businessmen make lots of cash. So, be nice to your turkeys this Christmas. Invite them indoors for some greens. Let them eat cake. (laughs) And let them partake in a plate of organic grown beans. They love it. Be nice to your turkeys this Christmas and spare them the cut of the knife. Join Turkeys United and they'll be delighted and you will make new friends for life. And that was Benjamin Zephaniah, Talking Turkeys. What a fitting poem for this Christmas issue. 
You're listening to the December Viva Vegan Podcast. Maybe this is your first show, your first podcast. Maybe you haven't even heard of Viva before. Let me just explain who we are. Now, Viva's fight is a fight for life, for animals and ourselves. We effectively campaign and take the brutal reality of intensive farming to people who can affect the most change. You, people, consumers... We have a a load of different campaigns promoting veganism as the best way to save animals from the suffering, protect the planet and improve your own health and help those in developing countries is by going vegan. In the past, we've cleared the shelves with so-called exotic meats and our campaign against factory farming on pigs, turkeys, ducks has seen deaths dive and meat and dairy consumption are down in the UK thanks to Viva and you. Viva is a charity and we need your help. If you want to join Viva, go to viva.org.uk forward slash join. We can't do this work without you. Thank you. Now, coming up next is my favourite interview that we've done on the podcast so far. And this is the interview that Juliet Galatly, Viva founder, did with Salish Rao, the executive director of the non-for-profit Climate Healers, but also the executive producer of the absolutely wonderful Cowspiracy film. Climate Healers was founded with an aim to reforest one-sixth of the ice-free land area of the Earth to neutralise human carbon dioxide emissions temporarily. Among its projects, Climate Healers partners with NGOs, tribal villages, school clubs to help low-income areas in India use solar rather than wood-burning stoves. Now, his work promoting veganism and his understanding of veganism as an emotional, mental, physical and spiritual ideal completely resonated with me when I heard this interview. So as such, I've let the interview go in full. When editing it, I couldn't leave anything out. I really hope you enjoy it as much as I have. It's going to be split in two parts. So this is the first part and the second part will come later in the show. Enjoy. I'm really delighted to meet you. Thank you so much for coming to Viva's offices today in Bristol. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, Can you just, going back in time, tell me why you went vegan yourself? Well, I went vegan in 2008, and it was for the environment. Right. And it was actually very accidental. You know, I had gone to this village in Rajasthan, India, and I was working with the people there on their cooking solutions. And the people there had, had uh, uh, protected 250 acres of common land in 2002. So they had given me pictures of the before and after. So 250 acres of common land in 2002, what it looked like, and in 2006, how it was a forest. So they protected it from what exactly? What was going protected, on? They put a stone fence so yeah. that their animals, their cows and their goats, don't go in. Okay. So just preventing their yeah. farmed animals from going in helped the forest come back. So they had given me this before and after picture, and I used to show that in my presentations. I was talking about climate change, and I was saying, see how easy we can bring it back if we just prevent animals from going inside. And people are asking me, are you sure they didn't take the first picture during summer and the second picture during winter? <laughs> you know? So I was also doubtful. Maybe they're fooling me, right? <laughs> so when I went to the village in 2008, I asked the people to take me to the forest and show me. So I went there and I took a picture of that fence and I immediately decided I have to go vegan. Because to the left of the fence, the animals are walking around grazing and there were all these old cows. Mm-hmm. Because in India we drink a lot of milk mm-hmm. and we don't eat the beef. So mm-hmm. the cows live for 25 years and mm-hmm. they're walking around eating up the forest. Mm-hmm. So to the right of the fence it was lush green forest. Mm-hmm. So I realized that as a, as a vegetarian, mm-hmm. I was actually causing more harm mm-hmm. than if I were to eat some beef. Mm-hmm. You know? So I had this sense of shame. And I really think that change does not happen mm-hmm. unless you feel that kind of shame. Mm-hmm. You know? so I, I had the sense of shame and I immediately said, I have to go vegan. (laughs) And I went vegan and within a week, uh, I had this huge sense of guilt lift off my shoulders. Mm. And I realized that I had been carrying that guilt for 40 years. Mm. Because, you see, as a child, I was visiting my uh, my grandparents' home. My grandparents had cows and they they were rice farmers. And my grandmother, I overheard my grandmother talking to my grandfather. And my grandmother was telling my grandfather that this particular calf was drinking too much. It was not leaving enough milk for the children. So what do I do? And my grandfather told my grandmother, don't let him drink to his fill. Pull him away after 10 minutes. And I knew as a child that there was something wrong going on. Mm. 
you know. But I guess I put it away in the back of my mind that that was giving me guilt every time I drank milk. Mm. So, in India, um, consuming dairy must be a major problem in terms of deforestation, which is one of your right. obviously one of your main cons. Yeah. Um, how how much forest is left now in India? Well, see, the official statistic is that. 20% of India, I think 23% of India is forested. That's the official statistic. Mm -hmm. And that's based on looking at tree cover and then they have this rule, if you have 10% tree cover in a certain area, it's a forest. <laughs> you know? So that's how they count forests. Sure. So if you look at the forest map of India, as the, US, uh, the Indian government puts it out, you'll see all these little, little dots all over the place mm -hmm. and then a few big clumps. But then if you look at the density of cows in India, India has 330 million heads of cattle, which is cows and buffaloes put together. It's huge. Which is more than three times the number of cows in the U.S. Mm. on one third the land area of the U.S. So it's really a ten times the density of cows in the U.S. Okay, and if you look at the bovine density map of India, every part of India is covered. Mm. So even the forests, the so-called forests, are full of cows. Yeah, right. Okay. So what, what good is a forest, you yeah. know? I mean, it's not really not going to support any wild animals because when the cows finish eating, mm. there is nothing for the deer to eat, so the deer dies. Mm. And when the deer dies, the tiger dies. Yeah. So if the animals are dying, what the forest is going to die. Mm. There's no way out. You know? So you set up an organization called Climate Healers. Um, Tell me about that, What what is, because you're looking for positive solutions, aren't you? You're not just educating people, you're looking to actually do something about this. Right. Um, tell me what your main focus is of Climate Healers, some of the projects you're undertaking. So Climate Healers, I mean the objective of Climate Healers is to, to heal the climate, mm -hmm. is to reverse climate change. Mm -hmm. So we say, you know, we want to heal the climate from the inside out, heal the earth from the inside out. Because to, to reverse climate change, you literally have to heal every human being. Mm. You know, so it's, so it's a spiritual and cultural transformation. Mm. Uh, otherwise, climate change is going to continue. But you see, climate change is really the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's really the, the symptom of a mm -hmm. larger environmental problem. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the UN in 1992 had identified three major problems in the environment. The first was biodiversity loss, mm -hmm. then, it was, and then the next was ecosystems collapse, and the third was climate change. Right. So they had three conventions mm -hmm. formed, the Convention on Biological Diversity, mm -hmm. the Convention to Combat Desertification, mm -hmm. and the Framework Convention on Climate Change. Mm -hmm. But we only hear about the third, you don't hear about the first two. Because mm -hmm. the first two represent the cancer underlying the fever. Mm -hmm. And to heal the climate you have to address the cancer, yeah. which is why we focus on reforestation yeah. and veganism. Yeah. So you think two of the biggest solutions that, that are being proffered or, or should be proffered uh, worldwide are reforestation and asking or telling people why being vegan is such a positive thing. Right. Um, how do you think you initiate that kind of massive social transformation where people accept that veganism is, is the way forward? Well, it is already happening. Mm -hmm. It is already happening because the signal is coming to people from all directions, whether it is from their personal health or from environmental issues, mm. or from animal cruelty, there is no hiding that this is a solution. Because veganism is the only thing that we can do to address the cancer underlying the fever. Mm -hmm. It also addresses the fever, okay? but it's, it is the number one thing you can do to address biodiversity loss. It's the number one thing you can do to address ecosystems collapse, or ocean dead zones. I mean, there are so many environmental issues that veganism addresses mm. that it doesn't make any sense for us not to talk about it. Mm. You know, but yet the governments don't talk about it. Mm. So you ask why. Well, Al Gore doesn't talk about yeah. it, and you ask why. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's a massive omission of his, I mean, an incredible documentary, but such an omission. Right. Yeah. And in fact, you're an executive producer on Cowspiracy, which looks at exactly those kind of questions. Right. Why major environmental organizations, and I know it concentrated on the USA, right. ignoring the biggest issue for the environment, which is what we eat. Right, yes. Um, so, has anything, the impact of Cowspiracy was huge. I mean, in the UK, um, from Viva, we talked to people about why they changed and Cowspiracy has had a genuine, tangible effect. Right. Did you expect it to be so successful from, in terms of changing people? Did you, did you predict that? In, I mean, we had no <laughs> idea. You know, and me, uh, in fact, the way I got into it was at the time when uh, Kip and Keegan lost their funding. Mm. You know, they did an Indiegogo campaign to, to get some funding. 
And so I happened to see their three minute clip. And I, and I said, this is exactly what I've been talking about. Right. You know? right. So, so I, I wrote to them and said, oh, can I take a look at the whole thing? Can you show me what you have? And they let me see a preview. And I said, we have to support these people. So we became executive producers. And uh, initially it was distributed um, through tug.com, mm -hmm. which is a, you know, which is a grassroots yeah. distribution program, you know, so where people can just organize a screening in their theater, mm -hmm. they can get enough people to come, they can, they have the screening. Um, and it was surprisingly popular, mm. right? It, just, it was just taking off. Mm. And then Leonardo DiCaprio saw it and he's, he said, oh, I, I want to put this on Netflix. So he got this on Netflix mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and that was just the beginning, yeah. it just took off. Yeah. Do you know how many mi millions, maybe people, have seen it? Are there, are there any, you know, I don't uh, really have the statistics. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, are you aware of the impact Cowspiracy has had on environmental groups? Has it shifted their position? It has prodded them a lot. Yeah. Okay, but they are not yet talking mm. about it openly because it's a systemic issue. Mm. You know, these environmental groups are all funded by corporations or people in the current system. And so if they're well funded in the current system, they're reluctant to talk about things that would upset the system. You mean the people funding, the donors, the supporter right. base, who may be meat, fish, egg consumers, right. dairy consumers. Um, I noticed Greenpeace, I've heard anyway that Greenpeace globally next year are doing a campaign on meat reduction. Right. Uh, what's, uh, your, what's your view on that? See, meat reduction yeah. is basically like telling people, hey, it's not such a, it's not such a, major problem. Mm. Take your time, you know, which is not true. Mm. I mean, I'm telling people, if you look at the statistics mm. that the World Wildlife Fund has put out, mm. that 52 percent of all wild animals died between 1970 and 2010, and we are losing them at an additional 3 percent per year. Mm. So it's 58 percent down from 1970 to 2012. Mm. At when that you rate, you know, we don't have much time. By 2026, mm. they're all going to get wiped out. I mean, that, that sounds desperate, you right. know, and people listening to this will be like, how, how can we change that quickly? Right. Uh, and it does become very frustrating. I mean, I'm in the fortunate position that I have people all the time saying, I've changed because of something Viva's done. Mm -hmm. But the change isn't fast enough when you're aware of these kind of things happening. What, what, what's your feeling about that? How, you know, yeah, you know, how I, are we going to speed things up? No, we are <laughs> going to speed things up because, you see, I was in two major changes like this mm. in my life. And I saw it happen from the inside. Mm -hmm. so the first was the internet. Mm. And in 1995, uh, there was an article in Newsweek saying the internet is going nowhere. Who is going to read things on the internet? Who is going to buy stuff off the internet? Mm -hmm. It's going nowhere. Right? Mm -hmm. And by 2005, just 10 years later, mm -hmm. I overheard someone say, I cannot live without the internet. <laughs> yes. So it took over our lives so quickly within 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we weren't even aware of it. You know? It just happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. And in 2005, uh, one of my friends told me that gay marriage is never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> because at that time, you know, the, uh, San Francisco had tried to issue licenses mm -hmm. for gay people to get married and the California Supreme Court had uh, rejected it. Mm -hmm. So if, if you cannot do it in California, it will never happen anywhere. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was actually the mainstream opinion at that point. Mm -hmm. By 2015, 10 years later, mm -hmm. it was normal. Mm -hmm. Right? So it was legal in the U.S. And in 2015, I was giving a presentation at the AGU, mm -hmm. which is the largest gathering of climate scientists in the world. Right. And the paper we were presenting was, what would happen if the whole world goes vegan today? And we showed if the whole world goes vegan today, mm -hmm. we can sequester more carbon in recovering forests than we have added to the atmosphere since 1750. We can literally reverse climate change just by bringing back the original forests that were there in 1800 mm. in, on the grasslands that we have today, okay? So it's, it was open and shut. You yeah. couldn't argue with this because mm -hmm. it was just adding numbers up. So the climate scientists who came to me, they said, yeah, you're right, but it'll never happen. Yeah, yes, that is what they always say. Right, and yeah. I said, if that, yeah. I've heard this twice before, yeah. so by 2025, this is going to be normal, mm. you know? Because that's how fast nonlinear changes happen in society. Mm. 
you know, and our history is littered with such nonlinear transformations. Yeah. yeah. So you think social reformation is happening right now? Absolutely, yeah. it's happening right yeah. now. You know? Thank you for being a part of it. <laughs> Thank you for being a part of it. You know, we are all in this together. We are. <laughs> right. Thank you so much. And it's such an amazing time to be alive, isn't it? It is. I mean, yeah. We're making yeah. this massive change. And think about it, I mean, this is the greatest transformation in human history, and we are a part of it. Yeah, it is. It is, actually. It is. Yeah. And so important, so crucial. See, every transformation in human history has happened when we changed how we communicated, mm. and we changed how we harnessed energy, mm. and we changed what we ate. Mm. See, whether it was the fire, discovery mm -hmm. of fire, mm -hmm. fire was energy transformation, speech was the communications transformation, mm -hmm. and then cooking mm. was the food transformation. Sure. So then agriculture revolution, it was harnessing animal energy, okay? So that's when we started enslaving animals and yeah. domesticating them. Yeah. And for communication it was writing, mm. and then for food it was crops. Mm. And then the industrial revolution, it was fossil fuels for energy, it was the printing press for communications, mm. and it was industrial production of animal foods or, or other foods, you know? That was the food transformation that happened. So the poor animals who were helping us plow our fields suddenly became food animals, mm. you know? Mm. And now it is the internet for communications, so it's very distributed, everyone can talk to anybody. And uh, for uh, energy it's solar, mm. which is again distributed, it's falling on our heads, we pick it up, we don't have to be beholden to anybody. Mm. Not in Collect. the UK. No, well, it should be. <laughs> <laughs> and for food, it's veganism. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And these three things are going to, I mean, this is going to free us. Because every one of the previous major revolutions concentrated power in fewer and fewer people. Mm. And this transformation is going to distribute the power back to us. Mm. You just have to grab it, take it back. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, almost like convincing the slave that um, they, they, they need to be freed though. Because at the moment people are still in the mindset, or a lot yeah. of people, that they want to be a slave. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, it's, that's one of our challenges, isn't it? It's getting away from apathy. Right, yeah. yeah. In fact, Gus Pett had said that the three major environmental problems are mm. selfishness, mm. greed, mm. and apathy. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? yeah. And to solve them, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. Yeah. But you see, the veganism is such a simple spiritual transformation. Yeah. It also is a cultural transformation. It's all, it's all in one. Yeah. And it's about coming home to who you really are. Mm. Because I've asked thousands of people, you know, how many of you would deliberately hurt an innocent animal mm. unnecessarily? Mm. And no one has raised their hands mm. to me. You know? I tell them, by definition, you're all vegan. Mm. Even though you may be eating some animal foods, you're all vegan. Mm. That's who you are in your heart. Mm. But who you are and what you do are not in alignment. Mm. And bringing that into yeah, alignment is yoga. And that was part one of when Juliet Galatly, Viva founder and director, met Salish Rao. Part two is coming up later in the show. At Viva, we rely heavily on the gifts that people leave to us in their wills. Without this generosity from our supporters, we would not be able to do the crucial work that we do, investigating industrial farming and slaughter, and saving animals. We also promote veganism to millions of people every year. Leave a legacy which will help make the world a better, kinder place after you are gone. Please consider giving to Viva in your will. To find out more, please visit viva.org.uk forward slash legacies, or contact Tony Wardle by email on Tony at viva.org.uk or call 0117 944 You're listening to the December Viva Vegan Podcast. You can subscribe on all platforms or go to viva.org.uk forward slash Viva Podcast. We hope you enjoy the show. Please listen, subscribe and share. For those of you that are new to veganism or have been vegan for a while and are just looking for new ideas, we have a delicious vegan Christmas guide, okay? It's going to help you have a rocking Christmas. It's got everything you need for a compassionate Christmas feast. It's got 20 pages of beautiful recipes, mains, sides, desserts, and there's lovely photographs as well. So we've pulled out the stops to create a stunning, straightforward menu for you. The main courses are the magnificent Easy Mushroom Wellington, individual luxury festive roasts and a smoky leek and almond tart choice, 
We've got sumptuous sides, including red onion and wine gravy, how to make perfect roasties, maple roast parsnips, and luxury shredded Brussels sprouts. There's also an adorable mashed potato snowman with a chestnut and apricot stuffing. And dessert-wise, well, we've got individual raw raspberry cheesecakes, mini tiramisus, and Christmas brandy truffles, not forgetting your own individual Christmas cakes. So you can order these online by going to vivashop.org.uk forward slash Xmas recipes. That's vivashop.org.uk forward slash recipes. Or you can just give us a call 0117 944 1000. That's 0117 944 1000. Viva Shop. We lovingly handpick our merchandise, scouring the planet for animal-free amazingness and handcrafted herbivore delights. For the best in vegan-friendly beauty, books, clothing, accessories, food and gifts, shop kind at the Viva Shop. Go to vivashop.org.uk. That's vivashop.org.uk. Stormzy's Shut Up has had 56 million views on YouTube. What a tune! Everyone's been loving it. Anyway... Every now and again, someone goes around and does a parody. On this occasion, new rapper on the block, Jay Brave, has taken Stormzy's Shut Up, which is pretty brave, and done a vegan version. He's done a cracking job. Here it is. What up, Jay? Yo. Shout out Stormzy on this one. Vegan Shut Up. Too many people chatting ish about being a vegan. Yo. Yo. Man try to say you gotta eat meat. Tell my man shut up. Anti-vegan tweets. Hey rude boy, shut, shut up. up. Wanna say I'm weak? Shut up. Best in the scene, yo. yo. Yo, couple man wanna say meat is protein. I show him tempeh, now nah, meat is protein. Well, if you're saying that meat is protein, that dog in your house, call that protein. The girl in my crib, call that protein. Man wanna talk about meat is protein. Big man like me with a beard, I'm a big man like yo. Seeds on my legs is what I grow, and whole foods is the place I go. Walk in a shop with my cotton bags, get great food, then I go home. Meet new people, namaste, try and live life sustainably. Tell a man I tell a J to the A, there's no wasted, we don't slay. Plants are the best, not being cocky, I've got a cup of fresh made coffee. I've got friends, I think we should copy, what's their life is still my hobby. Zero waste, athlete body, they get better while the world gets sloppy. And yeah, I mean it, not getting soppy, better believe it, start getting worried. If you got an MSC, bring it out, nutritionist will jump and shout you gotta eat meat but ignoring the gout stay in your seat bound please shut your mouth but you see my man over there with the sprouts he'll make a juice for you to try out all of my man them don't eat foul might eat my girl but we don't eat out now these menus make me pout chips and a salad is my only out roll in look then roll out i'm so london i'm so sour food of my friends when we ain't got now need to talk what's this all about but we wanna make the world so proud like reclaim land have a friend that's a cow all of these flat teeth falls in a jar high and amigas are better by far had spare change so i bought new plants Cold pressed juice that I bought for my ma When I cook food it's a walk in the park Cause I take care when I season the parts These pricks wanna tell me about myself Well you don't even know who you are Marketing men have got you zoned Subliminal messages you see through your phone Little man team when you think that you're grown How you gonna eat that meat from a bone? So damn hungry, third world hungry Kids ain't got no meat on their bones Animal feed all they need to grow Brains getting washed and receiving control I'm a big fan of the grocery store A man that upset that it's gross to me more And yeah I got gas when I notice my core Why? Cause I never got noticed before Duh! All of your carnies sound so bitter Trolls on Facebook, memes on Twitter Can't hold your tongue, can't hold your liquor More to say but I Look, if you don't hear this, shame on you If you don't share this, shame on you Can I get a viral hit with this skit? Matter of fact, better make that too Vegan followers, I need them too Missionary work with a vegan crew Shout out Stormzy, bars on the tune So I had to go so hard on the tune Check it, don't even talk too much for a talker Vegan search on my net a porter Still on my grind like pestle and mortar CBD oil and coconut water Break down barriers, break down borders Man in the kitchen, putting through orders Raw cocoa, skin clear like water Smoothing this thing, start looking up daughters Boom! And that was Jay Brave's vegan parody of Stormzy's Shut Up! Next up, I catch up with Katrina and Sophie from the Viva Shop to let you know what wonderful goodies they have in store this Christmas. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm good. Excellent. So what goodies have you got for us today? Right, so we had a scour of our Christmas range and actually it's quite exciting times in the shop because we've just launched our Gifts for Life catalogue and our entire merch floor is full of Christmas stuff, boxes, new staff coming in to help send out orders. So anyway, we trawled the shop and we found our favourite free from festive shopping ideas so that you can have yourself a, a very Viva, Viva Vegan, vegan Christmas. Christmas! 
That was brilliant. Well done. <laughs> Good work. <laughs> Can I have a look at one of the catalogues? Yeah. Let's have a look there over here. Ah, oh, that's Juliet's son on the it cover, is. isn't it? Weird. Yeah. Is that Hope the Pig? It's it's is one of one the of her piglets. piglets. Yeah, not, we so, had a not so piglety anymore. anymore. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. We had a really fun day out with Dean Farm Sanctuary, where obviously Hope and and Dottie are based. Uh, we spent the whole day mostly cuddling with the animals and getting a bit <laughs> muddy, yeah. rather than taking That's photos. Literally what yeah. it was, yeah. Let's have a look here. Oh, you got the compassionate tees. Compassionate tees, yeah. Yeah, be kind to all kinds. Yeah, be kind to all kind t-shirts. Yeah. They are absolutely fantastic, aren't mm. they? Yep, they've got really cool kind of foil. The, lo- the Viva logo is in a foil accent, which is a bit blingy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you've got the Got a Face, Don't Eat It t-shirt Yeah, which is Viva's got. top selling slogan ever. So it kind of every year we kind of refresh it. And yeah. this year it's part of a Got a Face um, collection, which has mugs and badges and stickers. Yeah. What's what's these t-shirts here? These, these are new, They're aren't Le they? They're Vegan. Le Vegan, nothing like, but Le Vegan. Yeah, like Love Vegan, but like merged. Yeah, like yeah. it, like it. Excellent. They look great as yeah. well. And Vegan is a state of kind. Yeah, which mm. I think, Chris, you might have actually come up oh, with yeah, that. It came Slogan. up that logo, yeah. didn't I? Oh, look at oh, that. Yeah, I think you have mentioned that once or twice. Do you know what? I felt a bit immortalised after that moment. Okay, ah, here we go. We're yeah. going on for chocolates now. Oh, yeah. you, these ones here. Now, are these like the vegan marathon uh, yeah. marathons that share my age? And it? They're called Snickers now, aren't they? Yeah. The chocolate version. Yeah, like vegan versions of Mars bars um, and Twixes and stuff, I think, isn't it? And like a vegan bounty. Ah, yeah. the vegan yep. bounty. If you guys mm. haven't had this before, definitely go for it. What are they called? Buccaneer? Jokers. Jokers, Twilight, Mahalo. There's even a Twix, which is called the Two for Now. Yeah, they they're actually they come all the way from the states from a company called Go Max Go, and we have to import them, but we think it's worth it. They came out maybe a couple years ago, and they were our top selling chocolate bar for years. So they're the kind of thing that you could give to a non vegan, and they'd just be like, "This is amazing." All I don't day long. Any difference. All yeah. day long, you know. Yeah. But my favorite by far is still the. Vigalinos. Oh, the little tiny. Yeah, they're, they're like the hazelnut pralines. pralines. Yeah. yeah, they are yeah. so, so they are good. Definition of melt in the mouth. They oh, are, aren't they? So, so a, a gift to anybody that's not vegan or anybody that is vegan. So, basically, everybody yeah. would like these. Yeah. They're really good quality pralines, yeah. melt in the mouth. And yeah, the only problem is you can eat the whole lot. You can. The <laughs> idea is because they're individually wrapped is that you kind of have one and then maybe save them for later or There's share There's like a barrier them. to entry each yeah. time, isn't it? You can yeah. open a new That's one. That's easier yeah. said than done. <laughs> <laughs> On the, on the other page, you've mm-hmm. got the sweet tooth, so you've got the yeah. jellies and things like that. Now, yeah. I used to be a real sweet tooth. I yeah. used to, I used to, before anymore. I was vegan, I used to have my Haribos <laughs> and stuff like that. I couldn't oh, get... Oh, yeah, yeah. But, this, you know, these are just fantastic. They're yep. a, a wonderful replacement, not just for kids, but for us as well, yeah. aren't they? And bottom right here, you've got these Freedom Mallows. <laughs> yes. Now, I did a post on our Viva Facebook <laughs> yep. page... Yep saying, oh, Sainsbury's are now stocking these mallows. Yeah. Oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, my God, they're not, they're not. I can't find them, I can't find them. <laughs> but we actually have them in the shop, at the Viva we shop. We do, we do. A lot, I mean, a lot of um, health food shops and obviously our own shop have stocked them for a while. But for that brand to go into um, a big supermarket chain is just showing a sign of the times, really. So what have you brought into the studio? My kind of top pick this year is actually something that you can wear. It's the Hope Not Hell tracksuit. So Hope Not Hell is based on a campaign that Viva recently ran, which was quite popular. It was partly crowdfunded to deal with pigs. And our tracksuit has a jacket and joggers, which is the lingo for sweatpants now. So it's a jacket and jogger (laughs) combo. We're actually all wearing them right now because they're that comfortable. Um, The idea behind this was that if you wanted to raise funds a bit more for, for Viva and the work we do to save animals that this is something practical that you can do. So the jacket and the bottoms, they're each, they're $27.50 each, but you can buy a set. And if you do, they, you save five pounds. Mm. But yeah, they're just a really simple logo. It goes down one side of the jacket and then on the opposite side on the joggers. And we kind of said, you know, in the catalog, we said they're perfect for Netflix binge watching. You know, nice yeah, little lounge sure. suit. And the good thing is, I mean, you mentioned it as well, is when you buy from the shop, from the yeah. Viva shop, you are actually supporting Viva at the same yes. time as well, as well as getting all these goodies yeah, and stuff 100%. as well. So it's, it's the best of both worlds for you, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Exactly. And I think it's, it's a really nice thing for, you know, for vegans, for people who care about animals. We love your donations, but this is also something that in terms of gifts in your life, being able to give a nice ethical vegan and our clothing is all fair trade gift, especially at Christmas, just kind of seals the deal. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah. when you are gonna, you know, planning on spending at least four days not leaving in the house over Christmas, you can just lounge yeah. around in the tracksuit. Yeah. These are like Christmas pajamas. Yeah. What else have we got? Right. So Sophie has actually agreed very willingly to <laughs> take some of our new 
new products in the shop. Mm. Obviously, Chris covered some of them that are in the catalog, but these are new things. And they're actually, we just launched our Gifts for Life web shop as well, as in last week. And all this new stuff, we have a special Christmas page up on there. It's vivashop.org.uk. So the first thing that Sophie's going to try is actually Kuban Buns, which actually has probably been pronounced really badly. It's a German word, and it just translates into cow sweets. There are no cow products in these (laughs) caramels whatsoever. Instead of kind of traditional cream used for caramels, they use coconut milk powder, which is just as creamy and delicious and obviously healthy and no animals. Um, so Sophie's going to try it now. I know, I have such a hard job. It's it's so <laughs> so what caramels. do you think, so? So, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, It's chewy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like in a really nice soft way. Like, yeah. It's like a little bit of veggie. I think they're not mm. kind of like break your teeth caramels. Mm. They're quite soft. Really? Mm. Yeah, Definitely no, really. Not. Oh, really. I might try one Yeah, then. go for it. Go on then. Mm. What's really handy is they're they really come nice. um, in a bag. Uh, with You get about 15 caramels in each, so they're kind of a nice stocking filler. Um, if you want to leave them out after dinner, it's kind of a nice, you know, sweet treat. Oh, they are soft. Yeah, see, yeah, they're soft. Are. They yeah. felt really hard. I mm. thought I was going to break my teeth, but mm. no, they're really nice. They're um they're exported from Germany. Keep, to- keep at the talking, moment. Katrina. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> keep talking while you guys eat. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, we yeah. can't eat right now. We're Definitely the wrong side of things. <laughs> <laughs> caramel's kind of an in food trend too, so oh. it's kind of oh, is it? Yeah, oh, salt and okay. caramel. Great, great, great. Let's have another one. Let's have another one because we are so in vogue. We're so we're so trendy. We're so trendy, aren't we? Just no meat minutes. So if everyone's finished, we finished your caramel. I think, I we'll think go on to the next finished. thing. Uh, I, have, I haven't actually quite finished. Because you're having a so I, I have one more, but you can, you can move to the next one. Right. There's brand new products actually that I think are perfect kind of festive treat and it's dark chocolate liqueurs and this one is filled with whiskey you can get them with brandy and there's also kind of a cherry liqueur one we've gone for whiskey because it's kind of uber festive they come in a box of 12 and they're they're actually very affordable they're one pound 50 so wow. it's dark chocolate and it's got a whiskey it's a teacher's whiskey scotch whiskey inside obviously a little bit of sugar so mm. sophie's gonna try one of these I hope there's not too much whiskey in it. I have to go back to work after. <laughs> I think if you eat the whole box, you oh, probably want to get a tiny bit tipsy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So mm. we yeah. thought this is a bit more, you know, the caramels for kitties and then the um, liqueurs for adults. Cool. Obviously. Put me in the kitty department, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. So they're a winner, yeah? Mm, I want another one. <laughs> go on, have another one. Go on. <laughs> Really good. <laughs> so let's give people the details yeah. about the shop, how they can order online this Christmas from Viva. So online, go to www.vivashop.org.uk. Everything is there. The brand new shop makes it really easy to find products. And we create a special Christmas page so that if you want something that's super festive, everything is listed on there. Orders usually take between five to seven working days. If you want it seedier, then just give us a call on 0117-944-1000. And obviously we can take orders over the phone. If you're going to be in Bristol in December, we have a massive Viva Vegan Festival, which is um, something that Sophie runs. We bring all of our stuff stock or most of it there too so if you want to come see things on the day you can do that yeah mm. yeah there'll be good offers as well at the festival so yeah. the festival is taking place on saturday the 9th of december and it's at bristol student unions so it's three pounds entry on the door or you can actually get in for two pounds if you're a student and yeah there's going to be loads of amazing food there and loads of stalls to look around and of course all viva staff are yep. going to be there we're going to be showing off what we do on our campaigns we're going to have our you know huge range of christmas merch uh, we've got talks and cookery demos. Um, Juliet, our founder, is giving two talks at this festival. She's an amazing speaker. So it's going to be a good day out. Fantastic. All right, well, thanks so much for coming in Pleasure. with these goodies. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, all that's left is for, to wish you all a very happy Christmas if we don't see you at the festival. So one, two, three, happy, happy Christmas. Christmas. And that was me catching up with Katrina and Sophie from the Viva Shop discussing some of the goodies that they've got in store for you. You can go to the Viva Shop right now and find out the full range of goodies that we've got this Christmas by just going to vivashop.org.uk. That's vivashop.org.uk. This is Kyle, a.k.a. the Vegan Rapper. You're listening to Chris Townsend on the Viva podcast, giving you all the information you need every month. And this is part two of Juliet Galatney's interview with Salish Rao. I've asked thousands of people, you know, how many of you would deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? And no one has raised their hands to me. No? I tell them, by definition, you're all vegan. Even though you may be eating some animal foods, you're all vegan. That's who you are in your heart. 
but who you are and what you do are not in alignment. Mm. And bringing that into yeah, alignment absolutely. is yoga. Yeah. You know? Right, okay. And that's your latest book? That's our latest book, um, yeah. So t tell me a little bit about that. Tell me its title and what its main uh, right. message is. Yeah. Sure. So uh, the title of the book is Carbon Yoga. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the subtitle is The Vegan Metamorphosis. Mm. Okay? And yoga is about how do you go about getting into alignment with who you really are. All of us as a species have to get into alignment with who we really are. And when we do that, so when we heal ourselves, when we come into alignment with ourselves, the earth comes back into alignment with who it is. So she becomes Eden again. Mm. Okay? So it's a simple transformation that, so it's, it's really about coming home. Right. And I tell people, you know, when, you, when you're coming home, even if you stumble and fall, don't worry about it. Just get up and keep coming. It's a journey. We are all on this journey. It sounds a very positive book. It is a positive book. Do you feel positive? Do you think the transformation can happen? I absolutely feel positive. Yeah. I mean, I really think, it's not just positive, you know, I really feel that this is realistic. Right. So, so, so it is happening. Tell me a little bit about climate healers, because I, I read online that you had, your, one of your aims is to reforest one-sixth of the Earth's landmass. Right. Which, again, it sounds so wonderful. Are there some tangible product, uh, sorry, projects that you can tell me about that, where you're making this happen? Well, the, the, the way to make it happen is through veganism. Because what I've found is that if we just leave land alone, especially in areas where the rainfall is still coming, mm. then the forest comes back. And which is what you were saying at the start in, in, right. in that part of India. Right, yes. Yeah, which so, is an amazing example, isn't it? Of, it's, uh, just leave nature alone. Right. Yeah. Because as, as long as the monsoons are there, yeah. the forest comes back. When the forest comes back, the monsoons get strengthened. Yeah. So it's, it's this positive feedback cycle, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's difficult to get that done in the, in the deserts of the world yeah. because the rains have stopped coming. Yes. But in lots of places where if you just leave land alone, yeah. nature comes back, forest comes back. Can you just say, just sum up why the forests are so important? Because I think a lot of people kind of know they are, but they're not absolutely certain about why they are. Right. So forests are where, you know, most of our biodiversity lives mm -hmm. and the ocean as well. Mm -hmm. So if you stop eating fish as well, they leave the ocean alone, the ocean will bounce back. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you have to stop polluting, of course. That's yeah. the other thing. Mm -hmm. So forests are important because they are not only a store of carbon. You know, half the weight of a tree is carbon mm -hmm. that used to be in the atmosphere. So the tree is sucking carbon out of the atmosphere yeah. and putting it on the ground. Okay, so a forest is putting carbon in the form of trees and in the soil as well. So if you look at the total amount of carbon in the at in the uh, on land, it's three times the total amount of carbon in the atmosphere. Okay, so we have to take down 30% or 40% of the carbon that's in the atmosphere. You know, if you have land that already has three times the amount of carbon in the atmosphere, you just have to increase it by 10%, mm -hmm. then it will suck up <laughs> all that excess carbon and put it on the ground. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. Uh -huh. So can't we increase the carbon content of land by 10%? Yes, we can, because there's so much of the forest that we have, de that we have cut down and turned into grasslands so we just have to bring back the original forest. Mm -hmm. This is the calculation that we did, you know. Right. If you bring back the original forest mm -hmm. on one-sixth of the land area of the planet, mm -hmm. you can reverse climate change, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And of course, you need to switch to solar energy and we need to reduce our energy use yeah. overall. So there is a whole system that we need to build yeah. around a life-affirming global culture. Do you think that the change, because every argument is in let's say our favour, right. the world's favour, every argument from the environment, from health, and obviously from the animal's perspective. Right. Um, how Do you think the change is going to come from the bottom up, for want of a better expression, right. that the governments are going to resist this to the last final moment? Right. Or do you think there's, do you see any sort of doors opening where governments are finally starting to listen and people are being brave enough to actually say something? Or do you just think they're just too short term? No, you, you see, when all changes happen both bottom up and top down. So... Um, it has to be. You know, it has to begin from the bottom up. There's no question. Otherwise, they will. They're happy with keeping things as they are. Mm. Even though they have children and grandchildren. You know, there is a <laughs> book called uh, yeah. "The Patterning Instinct" right. by Jeremy Lent. Okay. It just came out a couple of months ago, and he talks about three possible futures for humanity. First is a complete collapse of civilization, mm -hmm. which nobody really works for. Mm -hmm. The second is the techno split, mm -hmm. which is 
an extreme inequality between the haves and the have-nots. Mm. So that's where the current system is heading towards. Yeah. And people who are running the current system are trying to make sure that they are at the top of this techno split, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. so they are the haves, and yeah. so the rest of us will be the have-nots, yeah. right? The third is the great transition, or the great transformation of values. So it's a great transition from a life-destroying culture that we have today mm -hmm. to a life-affirming culture. Mm -hmm. So it's going from selfishness to selflessness, mm -hmm. going from greed to generosity, mm -hmm. and going from apathy to activism. Mm -hmm. So it, it, you think about it, it, you cannot do these mm -hmm. kind of transformations by just tweaking laws. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different yeah. system, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you really have to build a new system mm -hmm. and then in parallel with the current system mm -hmm. and help people adopt it. And as more and more people adopt it, then these guys are going to come along and say, hey, wait a minute, <laughs> no one's listening to us yeah. anymore. We're becoming irrelevant, so we might as well join them. Mm. Okay? And we can help you. How about we come and do it in our town? Mm. You know, so you can get them to come and support you once you have enough of a momentum going on from the bottom up. Mm. Like in Phoenix, we have, a, in, we have this monthly vegan festival. Mm -hmm. okay? It's every month. The last Friday of every month, we block off a, a one block and we have food trucks and we have food vendors and clothing vendors and shoe vendors and all kinds of vegan activism going on there. Thousands of people come. Every okay. month? Every month. Wow. Every month. It's and it's something that everyone looks forward to, right? Yeah. And the city of Mesa has given us that land and given oh, us excellent. that street to do it. That's wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? It is. So it begins from the bottom up and yes. then the city comes along, the yes. government comes along and says, yeah, the people want it and it's going to bring people to our city, mm. okay, from yeah. all over. Yeah, we want this to happen. It's exciting, isn't it? There's tangible change going across the globe. Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's wonderful. It's just one large vegan family, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's very, it's very tangible things. I mean, from a UK perspective, What's really exciting is that younger people have got back involved again. So, you know, you give talks to people and your audience will be full of 20-somethings. Right. And that's a tangible shift in the last five, six years. Right. Um, and it's like, well, not like, people are waking up to exactly what you're saying. Right. That this is the solution. And you can't rely on somebody else to do it for you. You just have to change within. Right. But it's a simple change. Right. And there are all kinds of things helping that happen, aren't they? And um, the arguments are getting ever more powerful, and I suppose more desperate is the truth. Right. But at the same time, big business is waking up and they want to make money out of this. And yeah. just from the perspective that they're making it easier for people to change is a positive right. it's, a, it's actually positive. It's a way that the current system is basically dissolving itself. Yeah. Because when corporations start putting money into this mm -hmm. and they support it and they help it grow, yeah eventually the overall footprint on the planet is going to shrink yeah. and they're going to collapse. Mm. <laughs> so mm. the whole system is going to collapse, right? Yeah. This is why they're scared of veganism. So yeah. do you think capitalism as a, as, a, as a political structure will collapse globally? Well, yeah, the political structure is really based on selfishness and mm. greed. You know, yeah. it's really, I mean, I'm not sure if you can blame capitalism mm. for selfishness and greed, but uh, uh, because if you look at uh, Adam Smith, I mean, he was talking about uh, enlightened self-interest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Enlightened self-interest to me is selflessness. Mm. Sure. You know, yeah. that's not how our corporations are acting now. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so this is not enlightened. This is not really capitalism yeah. in that sense, right. in the pu purest sense. Yeah. You know? So, so it's really about reinventing capitalism to be what it was meant to be. Mm. Okay. Do you, do in a new system. Do yeah. you have a vision in terms of what the world will look like as a vegan world? I mean, do you think things like population or overpopulation of human beings will be addressed in that world? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See, I really think that... Uh, I, I use the metaphor of the caterpillar turning to the butterfly. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the caterpillar is a blind consumer, right? So he just keeps con yeah. consuming until he becomes too big for his skin, right. which we currently are, mm -hmm. too big for our skin. Mm -hmm. We are 60% larger than what the planet can support. Mm -hmm. Right, so then strange things begin to happen inside the caterpillar. New cells are born called imaginal cells. At first, the caterpillar's immune system thinks that these imaginal cells are foreign cells, so it fights them. And then more and more imaginal cells are born, and the caterpillar's immune system gives up. It starts building vegan restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> I love that metaphor. That's beautiful. <laughs> right, and then the caterpillar 
builds a cocoon around himself mm -hmm. okay, to restrict his overall footprint and hangs under a twig and meditates for a week. Mm -hmm. And inside the caterpillar, the, the, these imaginal cells start clumping together to form different organs of the butterfly. Mm. And then when the butterfly is born, she's a very discriminating consumer. She only sips nectar from the flowers. <laughs> and in the process, she pollinates the flowers, she regenerates mm. life. Mm. She undoes the damage that happened in the mm. caterpillar phase. Mm. So, but for the butterfly to be born, there had to be a caterpillar. See, you well. cannot get a butterfly without the caterpillar. Mm. This is why, you know, when Buddha, Buddha said the world is full of suffering, mm. right? And the root cause of suffering is attachment. Mm -hmm. And you can overcome this suffering by just mm. letting go of this attachment. Yeah. So simple. Yeah. But the problem was the suffering was systemic. Yeah. So we were organized in a way that mm. caused that suffering. Yeah. Okay? So it's about regenerating, you know, mm. regen changing our system so that you are promoting selflessness, mm. you're promoting um, generosity yeah. and, and, and activism and then suddenly in building a cocoon so that our overall footprint does not exceed half mm. the earth so the other half can be given back to wildlife right sure and sometimes one of the ironies I think it, again, coming back to the UK is that those that suffer the most are most entrenched in the current system right they are they are yeah. but you know it once you, you know everyone has this natural instinct mm. to over, overcome their suffering. They don't want to suffer, mm. right? But a lot of us are stuck. Yeah. And so we are stuck in this prison. Yeah. And we are suffering. Yeah. So, but but in the caterpillar, you know, in the in the cocoon of the caterpillar, mm. where you limit the overall footprint, mm. and you can still have a capitalist system with with a, within a constraint. And when you do that, it turns out that people become very creative. Yeah. When you put constraints on people, yeah. they become very creative. Yeah. So we will find ways yeah. to do things that are, you know, mm -hmm. um, amazing. I think. Mm -hmm. But you have to have some fundamental axioms mm -hmm. in there, which is sure. respect for life, yeah. right? And you cannot put toxins mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. These are the that's the sure. first movie we did, the Human Experiment, yeah. which is about the eighty-seven thousand different chemicals that we're pouring into the environment right, right now, without hardly any regulation. Mm -hmm. So. And we, we know a lot of them are toxic. Mm. So they're all out there. And in fact, the total amount of chemicals we put out there is five times the total amount of carbon dioxide we put into the atmosphere. Mm. Yet nobody talks about it, mm. right? Tell me, don't tell me that that's not a big problem compared mm. to CO2. Yeah, <laughs> <You know? so. laughs> it's actually a much bigger problem, mm. right? And, and all those chemicals are working their way up the food chain. And the animals are hurting. Mm. They're getting cancer too. It's not just us. Mm. And no one's treating them. Mm. You know, their water is so dirty and they're drinking the water as is. There's no one to filter it for them. Mm. So one of your heroes is one of mine too. I don't have many heroes at all, but uh, is Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. Yes. Uh, just say a little bit about how uh, Mahatma Gandhi's teachings influenced you and how you think about us reaching this better place. Mahatma Gandhi showed how social change can happen. Mm -hmm with personal change. Mm. So it wasn't that he, he just changed his clothes and then said, look at me. No, he was very active, right? Mm -hmm. So, he, so he, did, he started the Kali movement in 1919. Mm -hmm. Do you know how it happened? Yeah, you tell me. It was amazing. I mean, no one really knew, knew who he was in mm -hmm. India right. until 1909, okay? But in 1909, he wrote a book called Hind Swaraj. He wrote that when uh, he was on a ship going from London back to South Africa. So he was a lawyer, right? He was yeah, a lawyer in South yeah. Africa at that time. And he was act having a conversation with the fellow passenger, and the fellow passenger took notes. And so they published it as Hind Swaraj. Right. And the British government in India banned the book. Oh. <laughs> so it immediately became a bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> so it was translated into every language in India, and people knew who he was, right? right? Because of that. And so when he landed in India in 1915, he was welcomed as a hero right. because of that book. Mm. So then he went to around the villages of India. He traveled for three years mm. and talking to people. And then he started the Kadi movement in 1919. Mm. And it was a simple idea. He said, he asked people to just change their clothes. Change your clothes from British clothes to Kadi clothes made by Indians in India. Right. Okay. It was a simple act that anybody could do. But it was a substantial act because the textile industry was the largest industry in England at that Gosh, time. Clever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? 
and it was a spiritual act because mm -hmm. it connected all of India together. They saw everyone wearing the same clothes. Mm -hmm. It was all supposed to be white khadi, mm -hmm. and they said, "Oh, you are on, in the same movement." So. Mm -hmm. We are all brothers, right? Brothers and sisters. So this united the people of India, you know, cohesively. And he was very militant about it. He would, he even wrote, "I consider it my duty to use every honest means at my disposal to make people wear khadi." <laughs> so, so he wasn't just wearing khadi and saying, "Look at me." No, he was going around making. Me, Why aren't you wearing khadi, right? So he was going around making people change, right? And he asked because he knew that once people change to Kadi completely, then they become activists and they go mm. tell others as well. Sure. Mm. I consider the vegan movement today to be the exact equivalent of the Kadi movement. Mm. Okay? It's also a simple act. It's about changing what we eat. It's a substantial act because mm. it's the, this is the largest industry in the world at this time, the mm. food industry. Mm. Okay? And it's a spiritual act mm. because it puts us back into connection with who we really are. Mm. We have compassion at our very core of our being. Mm. Right, so this is going to unite all of us all throughout the world to to transform our civilization to a life affirming civilization. This is the great transition that I'm talking about. And that was part two of Juliet Galatly's interview with Cowspiracy executive producer and executive director of Climate Healers, Salish Rao. Now, in September 2017, Viva launched a campaign to raise enough money to bring the first vegan cinema ad to the UK. Now, after one month and over 1,400 donations, we absolutely smashed that goal. So I just wanted to say thank you for the support. We raised over £102,000. Now, if you wanted to view the Hall of Fame, which lists all the people that donated to the campaign, you can do so by going to forward slash bring hope to millions. That's viva.org.uk forward slash bring hope to millions. We reached our £100,000 goal and now we will reach 2.2 million cinema goers. So one more time, thank you very much for all your support. We couldn't have done it without you. Now, we just want to give you guys a reminder to go to Showcase Cinemas nationwide to see the Hope ad between December the 1st and January the 4th. That's between December the 1st and January the 4th. You can go to viva.org.uk forward slash bring hope to millions for updates each Thursday as to precisely where these adverts will be shown. So if you want to see where the adverts are going to be shown and you want to go and see the advert, see it between December the 1st and January the 4th and go to viva.org.uk forward slash bring hope to millions to get updates as to precisely where the advert will be shown. Thank you very much again. We really are bringing hope to millions. Right, so it's our December episode. With December comes sometimes a lot of indulgence because of Christmas, but also cold weather. So I'm here with Veronica from Viva Health, who's hopefully going to give us some healthy tips about how to stay warm and healthy during this Christmas period. Are you OK? I'm happy to give some advice. Yeah, yeah Thank brilliant. You. Well, it's nice, nice for you to come in. Thank you. And uh, great to see you. Now, how can people balance out all our festive treats and do you have any sort of health advice for the holiday period? Definitely, yes. Uh, when we indulge, it's really important to balance it out by eating something a bit more nutritious. A lot of people think that uh, they just need to eat a bit less to compensate for, for the excesses, uh, but that's not necessarily going to make you look or feel better. Uh, what's really important is um, to make healthier foods a part of your daily diet so your body can cope wet a bit better with all the fun and stress of, mm. of uh, the holidays. Um, so things, simple things like having fruitful snacks, uh, make a big smoothie in the morning if you think you're going to just uh, have treats and indulge for the rest of the day um, have a side salad with the main or when you're having little sweet treats um, have dried figs or other dried fruit alongside mm. because it helps uh, help your digestive system and it just helps keep you a bit healthier okay okay I think it is so easy isn't it just to to not get that intake of nutrition when you, you know, during the holiday period, you can wake up and you can just eat loads of crap all day. Mm. And the actual, you might be full up, but the nutritional value of it is so low. Suddenly you, you're not getting the nutrition you need to, to stave off the, the winter blues, so to speak. 
precisely. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, you know, you don't have to give up and think, oh, I've just eaten rubbish all day. So it doesn't matter. It does matter. And it can make you feel better about yourself. So mm. why not do it? Something just a really simple little tweak, mm. just a smoothie in the morning or yeah. something like that. So obviously it's getting colder. I've got to confess today it's pretty <laughs> pretty freezing in the office actually You've got to get this heating on are there any foods to help us warm up uh yes uh, i mean in general warm food and warm drinks uh always help make you feel a bit warmer <laughs> <laughs> i know obvious stuff um but uh there are some spices or, or some little things you can do to uh make your circulation a bit better and, and warm yeah. up uh so anything any soups stews or sauces made with chili made with uh ginger uh, they all help to boost your circulation. So uh, whether it's a curry or bean chili, um, any kind of soup made with ginger, uh, lemon and ginger tea, all that uh, helps make you a bit warmer, better than just having a warm drink. Um, but speaking of drinks, there's one one big but. Um, Christmas drinks, all the festive, special Christmas flavoured lattes and um, hot chocolates. Well, there's not going to be much nutritional value in the new vegan Baileys that I reckon most people will be trying over the Christmas period. <laughs> a tiny little bit, yeah. No, but they can they can just be so colorific. So if you want to have a treat, uh, it might be better to have a cake and some less sweet drink because one of those like Christmas lattes or Christmas special festive uh, flavoured drinks they can pack more calories than a meal so just Mm. choose wisely yeah fair enough so people are prone to getting illnesses over the Christmas period what are the best foods to not just get better but stay well uh, when you're not well, uh, you're not always hungry. So I mean, that's a that's a problem. Yeah, uh, when when you need to get something to to feel better and recover or, or to stay healthy, uh, but you're not feeling very hungry. And the best way to get some healthy vitamins, some uh, good carbs, some antioxidants, and and water because staying hydrated is is really important. Is to make a smoothie. Mm. I know I'm com- keep coming back to smoothies, but if if you're not feeling hungry or if you don't want to, you have a sore throat, you don't want to uh, have anything. Thing that would hurt it so use any fruit or vegetables you like uh, either fresh or frozen just blend it all together mm. uh, and you're getting a lot of nutrients that way uh, if you have a cold or a flu or uh, have an upset stomach uh, lemon and ginger tea is really good because it helps to settle upset stomach uh, and ginger also helps to fight inflammation um, lemon has some vitamin c so the combination of lemon and ginger is is really really good. Yeah, bit of a banker, isn't it? The lemon and ginger tea. Yeah, yeah nice yeah. and warming. What I else mean, you got? Um, sorry, go on. Sorry, speaking of which, it's best to make it fresh rather than have a have a bag uh, yeah. of dried dried bit of dried lemon and a bit of dried ginger. It's it's just best to use and fresh it's ingredients. It's so easy. It's literally buy a piece of ginger, chop it up. You know, put a couple of pieces yeah. in and chop a bit of lemon in, and it's just job yeah, done, isn't yeah. it? it? Really, and you really can taste the difference. And if you don't want lemon, you can use any other citrus fruit works the same and it's really good so you can have orange and ginger yeah can i ask a question about um Mm. obviously with with lemons um obviously you you slice the slice lemon you know you can slice a lemon but then you've got the um the lemon juice that you can buy Mm -hmm. in bottles yeah it's like lemon concentrate or something it's not concentrated but it is lemon juice is that the same or has something happened to that juice to make it it is concentrated. Sometimes it's pasteurised um, just to prolong its shelf life. So uh, it should say on the bottle, but if it doesn't say, it's it's more likely that it's pasteurised. So it still has vitamin C, but it might not have uh, some of the other nutrients you get in fresh lemon juice. Mm, okay. What else have you got for us then, um, food-wise now? Well, food-wise, um, so if you're not very well, uh, your body still needs protein, minerals, and salts because if you you know if you're not well, you're a bit you're sweating, you're losing uh, liquids. So uh, a very good way of, of replenishing all that is um, eating a lentil soup or, or lentil dal. Now you're talking my language. <laughs> like I eat dal every day for it's breakfast, lunch, and tea. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, yeah it's, it's really simple to make. Uh, it's so healthy, and it gives you all the nutrients you need. I mean, not every single one of them, but a lot of nutrients that you need um, and if you add some vegetables in it if you add um, onions and garlic even better because th- those two help fight bacteria and you can add some herbs as well such as turmeric ginger and oregano
and those as well add to help fight inflammation and make you breathe easier as well if yeah. it's if, if the illness is affecting your airways. So overall, it's a win-win. Yeah, sounds good. I like whacking loads of garlic and extra chilli in mine. A garlicky taco dal with extra chilli. Mm, mm, mm. Always helps. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Okay, what else you got? Uh, bananas, bananas are bananas, amazing. Bananas, yeah, wicked. Uh, especially when you have a sore throat, make just freeze bananas, blend them into banana ice cream. It's healthy, it's really delicious, and it helps to put some nutrients in you. Yeah, sure. And the other one would probably be porridge as well, isn't it? Porridge is the best thing. It's uh, it's often forgotten, but it's a very uh, humble meal with lots and lots of nutrients because um, apart from oats, <laughs> yeah. obviously, which are which are really good source of healthy carbohydrates, brilliant source of protein as well. Not many people realize that oats are great pr- for protein. Um, you put some fruit in there, you put some nuts and seeds, and it's a great nutrition package. And if you're not, uh, again, if you're not feeling well, it's something that's really easy. You don't have to spend hours cooking it. You just spend 10 minutes Definitely. chucking it all together. Definitely. Let's squeeze Let's squeeze these healthy foods in amongst our junk food eating over the Christmas period. So we've got veg and fruit smoothies. We've got lemon and, uh, lemon? Lemon, lemon and <laughs> ginger <Lemony>. tea. <laughs> lemon and ginger tea. We've got lentil soup or dal, bananas and porridge. If you can get any of those in over the Christmas period, hopefully that will keep you warm, stop you getting ill in the first place. So uh, you eat well to stay well. Exactly. Lovely. Could Thanks, have Veronica. Put it better. Yeah, you could do what? Sorry, you could have put it better. I could have put it better. Oh, yes. oh so you're spoiling <laughs> me. I bet you could have. Listen, <laughs> lovely to see you. Thanks for coming in, and we'll see you on the other side of the new year. Uh, hopefully, yeah. I'll see you later. Bye. Bye. And what a way to finish the show than with the anti poets and their poem, Turkeys Don't Write Poetry. Turkeys don't write poetry, they're just for Christmas Day. But either one would like to hear just what they had to say about the way they're treated while their short lives are of use of the prison camp conditions and the poetry abuse. I'd like to hear their argument for maximum working hours, for root to stretch their withered legs and fair trade union powers. I'd like to hear their views on drugs and crash facilities, unfair production. Quotas and the death penalties. I'd read a turkey's poetry if only they were able to live long enough to write it for their stuff on someone's table. The anti poets. Turkeys don't write poetry. We really hope you have a lovely Christmas, a kind and compassionate Christmas. That's what it's all about. Leave those animals off your plate. After all, you don't eat your friends. Spend time with your loved ones and spread that vegan message. Happy Christmas, everyone, from Viva. And I look forward to speaking with you on the January podcast. Bye.